some of the things I believe we're going to look at. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things we can learn how not to use our tongue, but there is a way we're supposed to use our tongue. So it's not all uh, um, things that we can't do or things that we do wrong. There's some things, you know, our, our tongue is useful. Uh, it, there's some good things we can do, uh, good things we can say, encouragements we can be. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about some of that as well. So our first, uh, our first point, number one, is 2 Samuel 2. Verse 3a, we're going to fill in the blank there. Somebody want to read that? Talk no more, exceeding proudly. Let not any arrogancy come out of your mouth. Yep, talk no more, exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. And again, that's not necessarily... Uh, a list of words we're not supposed to use per se, but an attitude that we should not have. Does that make sense? Um, there are words and phrases that make us look arrogant and proud, but there are, we could say the nicest of words in the wrong way at the wrong time and be speaking proudly uh, or arrogant. And those are some things we're not supposed to do. Now we're going to switch over to the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 19 and verse 14. So it's asking us, what did David want to be acceptable in the sight of the Lord? He said the words of his mouth, right? And what else? The meditation of his heart. That's right. What is the meditation of our heart? What's another word we can call that, you think? Our thought life, maybe? The meditations of our heart, wouldn't that be our thought life? Hey, listen, God cares about us so much, he even cares about our thought life. Why, uh, time after time in the Bible, in different places, why do we see so much attention brought to our thought life? you have any thoughts on that tonight? Why, what, would, what would be so important about our thought life? It's just thoughts, right? Nobody can see them, nobody can hear them, nobody knows what they are. What's the big deal? What's, what's the big deal about our thought life? He does. God understands. But what else? That's exactly right. Our thoughts can become actions. And if we let our, our heart be filled with impure thoughts, it will affect the way we act. So he didn't just want the words of his mouth to be acceptable. Do we not live in a generation or a time, a, 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 a dot in time? in history that uh, folks seem to be more concerned with the words of their mouth than their actions and their attitudes. Um, and, and I'm not, we're not making this any at all political tonight, but look at the political realm. They say all kinds of things, but how much of it actually turns into actions or is truthful or, or, or comes about uh, the way they said it would? There's just not a whole lot. And that's just not a particular side. That's most politicians. That's why if someone says you talk like a politician, it's really not a compliment. So uh, the words of our mouth, when, when, when the world watches us, which one do you think they notice the most, though? Our actions or our words? Our actions, right? Our neighbors know uh, when they're doing something wrong, maybe let's let's say that our neighbors uh, like to have um, maybe big parties in the summertime where there's loud music and, and lots of alcohol and all kinds of things like that. And I'm not saying you know <laughs> any certain things in particular, but if we were to go to that neighbor were to come to us and they were to say, "Hey, why don't you come on over to my party?" And our answer is. 
I don't do things like that. I could never let my spiritual body partake of such sinful activities. And then Sunday rolls around and they see us mowing our lawn instead of going to church. What does our neighbors think? Hey, wait a minute. You didn't want to come over here to a party. You didn't have to drink. You didn't have to do anything. But you wouldn't even come over. But it's no big deal to miss church. Or they see us, hear us say things we shouldn't. Uh, maybe if somebody cuts us off in traffic or they come, they happen to come to our house and we're watching a TV or a movie that's full of uh, 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 filth. They see more than they hear, if that makes any sense to us. Uh, and that's why uh, this study that we're doing, these 12 lessons on biblical integrity are so important uh, because people watch. Uh, what number? Uh, number three, Psalms 26, 7. Does anyone want to read that one? All right, so we're filling blanks here. That I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Man, think about that for a minute. Do folks hear us uh, publishing the works of God uh, with the voice of thanksgiving? Or do they hear us talk about how impossible it is? And how hard it is. And how rough it is. We want to publish with our voice of thanksgiving the wondrous works of God. A couple chapters over, Psalm 30, verse 4. Filling in uh, blanks again here. What do we got? Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. He did, we're, we're on these verses now talking about things we need to do with our tongue. You know, and, and within the last, I don't know, the last couple months uh, of studying some of these things, uh, God has really convicted my heart. Uh, those of you that have been here for a little while, that, that I've been here, you've heard me say a thousand times, I can't sing a lick. You don't want to hear me sing. If I start singing, everybody's going to start leaving. Hey, all of that stuff is true. I'm not lying to you. But you know what the Bible tells me to do? Sing. That's right. It doesn't say sing if you think you're good. It doesn't say sing if somebody uh, pats you on the back and, and ask you to sing again. It says sing. Sing. Sing unto the Lord. I'm not saying, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be unkind, but the last couple Sundays I've been trying to sing. If you don't like the way I sing, you're going to have to sing louder. So you can't hear me. I don't know what else to say. But you know what? I'm not singing to anybody in this room. I'm commanded to sing unto the Lord. And if whether I like it or not, whether you enjoy it or not, he does. I don't understand that, but he does. And you know what I think he enjoys more than the tones and pitch and sounds coming out of my mouth? Coming from an obedient heart. You know, the memory verse says obedience is better than sacrifice. He likes when we obey. So I didn't say that so anybody would notice. But the last few Sundays, I was singing. And I'm sure it's not in key. I'm sure it's not, it's not anything pleasant. And if everybody needs to scoot back so they can't hear me, <laughs> that's all right. Hey, we're commanded to sing. All of us, uh, we're commanded to sing unto the Lord. Uh, verse 5, Psalms 34, 13. What instructions are given here concerning our tongue and our lips? Anybody got that verse? Right. We're supposed to keep our tongue from evil. Not, not let everybody have it. Not get it all out there and then just say, I'm sorry. But we're supposed to keep our tongue from evil and our lips from what? Speaking guile. Speaking guile. Right. If, if 
When God tells us to, to keep something, he put Adam in the garden to do what? To keep it, right? That was one of the things. He put him in the keep. Uh, and that was to take care of. That was the watch over. Listen, that's work. This may not come easy for some of us. It may not come easy for most of us, but we still have to do it. We're supposed to keep our tongue from evil and to keep our lips from speaking God. Number six, a uh, couple chapters over, verse 37, or chapter 37, verse 30, the first half. What does the mouth of the righteous speak? It is wisdom, that's right. Not, not arrogance, not ignorance, not blasphemy, not uh, 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 whatever, whatever word we're going to put in there, but it's wisdom. Now, what is wisdom? I asked my Bible class this one time, and I just, I guess, assumed that they knew. Uh, but when I asked what is wisdom, and you know what one of the kids told me? Knowledge. That's not necessarily true. Wisdom isn't necessarily knowledge. What is wisdom? The ability to use that knowledge. That's right. It's knowing how to use the knowledge that you have. Listen, we are the most, uh, 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 what's the word, knowledgeful, is that a word? Uh, generation probably that there ever been. We got more information at our fingertips than anyone else has ever had. Some of, some of you... Uh, uh, senior folks like me, you remember things called an encyclopedia. Man, when we wanted to know something, you had to go to a set of like 50 books to look it up and see what you could find. And, and then you, they'd turn around and change something. You'd have to get a new set in a couple years. And then you'd try to look. I mean, these kids today don't have any idea uh, what our Google used to look like. If you wanted to know something, you had to go look it up. Uh, but we have knowledge uh, in Bible class, and the kids got to be very careful because some of them like to uh, tell a story once in a while. And uh, about three seconds, I can bring out my phone and Google whatever they're talking about and show them what the answer was. Show them what they're trying to talk about. Uh, but there's a difference in having knowledge and knowing when to use it and how to use it and the proper way to use it. That's wisdom. Um, number seven. Psalm 63, 5. How did David describe his lips when praising the Lord? Somebody want to read 63, 5? My tongue shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise the Lord. Thank you. What kind of lips did he say? Joyful. That's right. Let me ask you this, and I may have asked this, we may have talked about this in the past a little bit too. What's the difference? between joy and happiness. Is there a difference between joy and happiness? Happiness is what is happening at the time. Joy is when we're feeling. In other words, Christ, he, when he was crucified, the joy of knowing what comes forth. Yes. Happiness comes from a happening. I'm happy because Amy's baking a cake. She's really not. She's home with a terrible headache. I wish she was baking a cake. But she's not not her. It's uh, She gets migraines once in a while. It's not because she has anything, but she gets migraines once in a while. Um, and she, right now, I would say she's not happy. But I would say that Amy has joy. She knows everything's going to be okay. She knows her joy comes from the Lord. She knows... Uh, uh, who is taking care of her and who is seeing her through. And listen, even in death, we can have joy. It's not necessarily easy all the time, but we can have joy. Why? Because Jesus gives us joy. We can't, we can't muster it up. We can't uh, hope for it. It comes from, my joy comes from the Lord. So there's a difference in joy and happiness. So we need to have joyful uh, lips. Psalms 141.3, number 8. What do we got? We're filling in blanks here. Psalms 
Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, and keep the door of my lips. What does that mean? What is he asking God to do? Keep him from saying something he shouldn't, right? Yeah, keep you from putting your foot in your mouth. Keep you from, listen, bringing uh, a, a bad mark against his name. Hey, understand when I, when I lose it, when I blow it, when I don't control my tongue, when I don't control my anger, when I don't control my attitude, the least of my concerns is what it makes me look like. It can make me look pretty foolish, but what I really should be concerned about, what does it make him look like? What does it make God look like? How, what, what does it do to the cause of Christ? We ask, should ask him to help keep a watch over our lips. Proverbs 4.24. What are believers instructed to put away? Who wants to read 4.24? Put away from thee a poor mouth and reservedly to pour from thee. What are we supposed to put away? A froward mouth? Yep. What else? Perverse lips. Uh, Proverbs 7 5. Who wants to read that one? So who uses their tongue for flattery? It's in the middle of the verse there. That they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. The strange woman is the answer there, the stranger. Anytime the Bible talks about the strange woman, is that a good connotation for someone to have? No, it's not at all. Not at all. Uh, Proverbs 8, 7. A, what does the mouth of wisdom speak? Proverbs 8, 7. For my mouth shall speak truth. Right. The truth. The whole truth. Nothing but the truth. 7b. What is an abomination to lips of wisdom? Say it again. Wickedness. Wickedness. Right. Now listen. So when we hear that word wickedness, Sometimes we think of the worst of the worst. Are you with me? You understand that wickedness is anything that's not godly. I don't have to be using the worst profanity in the world for my lips to be speaking wickedness. If I speak anything that goes against God, it's wickedness. Hey, listen, when a teacher stands up from a class and tells the kids, hey, you came from a monkey, she's speaking wicked, or he's speaking wickedness. It's opposite of what God tells us. When, when uh, a, a, a teacher or, or a, a somebody tells a little white lie, there is no such thing, but what folks would call a little white lie, they're actually speaking wickedness because it's against God. Uh, Proverbs 8, 8, the next verse. Fill in blanks. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or, for, forward or perverse in them. Proverbs 
Proverbs 10, rule number 14. Proverbs 10, 11. Got, anybody got Proverbs 10 and 11? So what is a well of life? The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. Why is that? How can we make that make sense? If he's a righteous man, he's going to be speaking things that help people, that edify people, that maybe correct people, but in the right way. It's a well of life. Have you ever been in a conversation or a, a, a confrontation or an altercation with someone and by the end of it, man, you just felt like you were dead. You felt like you had been whipped, beat, kicked. You just felt horrible. Have you, is it just me or has anyone ever else been in a conversation with somebody like that? That Whatever that conversation was did not come uh, from the uh, mouth of a righteous man. There's no well of life in that. But you know what? I've been in conversations. I've been in uh, uh, talking with someone and they corrected me. They told me what I did wrong. They did it in love. And you know what? Even when it was over, I felt alive. I felt like, man, I, well, I fixed this. This is going to be right. I, I didn't really see that my error my way. Uh, and it helps someone. It's all in the way we do it. It really is. It really is. Um, number 15, Proverbs 10, 13a. Yeah, we're filling in blanks here. In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is Found. That's right. That's where we find wisdom is in the lips uh, of him that understands. Then we're going to drop down to verse 32. What do the lips of the righteous know? Somebody want to read 1032? Yes, so what do the lips of the righteous know? What's acceptable, that's right. Is everybody caught up? Are we moving along too quick or are we good? We're good? Proverbs 12, 17. Filling in blanks here. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. Here's one area we must be extremely cautious because I believe with all my heart this is going to be something serious on Judgment Day. I can tell you some things and you'll believe me simply because I'm the pastor. Now, I would never do that to you on purpose. But there are folks that use their position to push their story because it makes it more believable. Are you with me? If you are a boss or supervisor or uh, even a parent and you think you know what happened, when you tell that story 
to another supervisor or to a grandparent or to another authority figure, is that person going to believe you or the child or the subordinate? Which one are they going to believe almost automatically? The parent or the supervisor, the person in authority. Why? Because they're in that position. You see what I mean? So if I use my position to uh, get you to believe my story, uh, that is that is nothing but deceit. And I believe, you know, that's on the, the, the seven things that God hates. That would be under a false witness that speaketh lies. That would be under uh, feet that are swift to mischief. That would be under uh, 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 sowing discord among the brethren. It's breaking multiple of the of the of the rules or of the sins that God hates. So um, when we talk about a uh, false witness uh, shows deceit, you know that deceit. We've got to be careful that the positions that we have in life, we all are in a position of authority somewhere. Would you agree with me with that? We all are. Nick, youngest guy in the room, when he is in the nursery. He's in a position of authority. When he's uh, maybe uh, in Sunday school class, maybe uh, Pat will say, hey, I've got to go make a copy or I've got to do something. Uh, Nick, I want you to be in charge till I get back. He can be in a position of authority. When he goes to school every day, Nick's the only senior at the school. Now I'm picking on you, Nick. I don't mean to. He's the only senior in the school. So does that put him in a position of authority? Maybe not necessarily, but he's in the highest position of being an example, which in itself is kind of or can be looked at as a position of authority. One of the kids at school could come up to Nick and say, hey, Nick, uh, uh, help me out with this. And Nick has the opportunity to help them uh, or to take advantage of that situation and uh, either play a prank or mess with that person or intentionally tell them something wrong. You say, that doesn't happen. It happens all the time. All the time. Uh, not Nick, but <laughs> I hope. But, it, but in the world we're talking. So uh, I just wanted to throw that little side note in there. Uh, using our position to make our story believable is wrong. I've seen uh, instances where a pastor in a church was wrong and because he was the pastor, he was believed over the person that he had the issue with. And we got to be careful of that. That's deceitful. Um, number 18. We're on Proverbs 16 and verse 24. Somebody want to read that? How are pleasant words uh, described? As honeycomb, right? Sweet to the soul. Absolutely. I'm sure if we if we were to think, we all probably have that person that comes to mind that they're just the sweetest person. Whatever they say is usually nice. Uh, um, that what you know their their thoughts, the things they talk about, they're not talking about other people, and it's just refreshing and a joy to be around somebody like that. Um, Proverbs seventeen twenty seven. He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and man of understanding with it hath not seen his spirit. So who spareth his words? He who hath knowledge. Um, and part of that knowledge, I believe, especially in this instance, is wisdom. Uh, my dad told me that that was um, one of the signs of maturity you could see in a young man. You know, when a, when a young man's a teenager uh, and he gets around three or four adults, he wants to tell everything that he knows uh, to look smart and be acceptable uh, but my dad said the true sign of wisdom is when you can be in a group of folks and you don't have to tell everything you know. If someone asks you a question, you can answer it, but you don't have to be the center of the conversation. You don't have to be uh, rattling off your credentials every time something needs done. That is a sign uh, of wisdom. 
um, being able to do these things. Number 20, with Proverbs 17, drop down to the next verse, 28. So who was counted wise when he holds his peace? A fool, right. Even a fool is wise when he learns to hold his peace. Um, Proverbs 18.4. We're filling in blanks here. Somebody got that one to read? The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters, and the wellspring of wisdom a flowing brook. Down to verse 21. 21a, the first part there. What two things are in the power of the tongue? What is it? That is it. Death and life. That's exactly right. The verse says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Hey, listen, you have the power every single day with every single person you come in contact with to be death or life. Simply by how you use your tongue. Those of you that might work in a school or around kids, you see kids that every, it seems like every adult figure in their life uh, speaks death to them. They can't do anything right at home. They can't do anything right with their friends. And sometimes, and I don't know why it works out this way, sometimes they get the teacher even that they can't get anything right with. How, how happy or, or full of life is that child? They're not. They're not. And then there's kids that, uh, you know, that, that have, and you know, they, they, they know there's a, it's easy to tell when, when kids come to camp or they come to school and, uh, you know, that all, all they seem like they want is someone to encourage them. There are kids that I've had in class that have got straight bad grades in multiple subjects, but they'll get a good grade. In Bible class, it has nothing to do with my teaching. It's I'm not I'm, I'm I'm not a very good teacher. But those kids want to do well because I love them. They want to make me happy because I make them happy. Does that make sense? Uh, my mom and 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 my dad and a lot, a lot of folks would say you'll catch more bees with honey than vinegar. It's easier to get someone to work with you and to comply and to do the things that uh, you hope to accomplish with them by being nice to them than it is by throwing around your position and your authority and, and your hatefulness. So uh, a death and life are in the tongue. And sadly, our world around us, there's so much death spoken to people that the rate of, of, of folks taking their life, their own life, is through the roof. Suicide rates are off the chart higher than they've ever been. And, 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 and not solely, but I believe one of the things that has a factor into doing with these things is just simply the way people treat them. You know, when, when you see kids at school that they're bullied and everybody gives them a hard time, and as much as we don't want to admit it, sometimes teachers even participate in these activities, and when that child just can't take anymore, they don't know where to turn. It's in the way we speak to them. We got to be very careful with the way we use your tongue. I, I, I'm honest. This thing's huge. It's one of the biggest things that they're looking at us in the face, and a lot of folks just look over it. Like I said Sunday, uh, they'll blame it on their 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 personality. They'll blame it on their upbringing. They'll blame it on. I told my kids in Bible class this morning. Your family history may make you vulnerable to repeat certain actions. But you don't have to. 
you have a choice. I, and I'm not very proud to tell it, but it's true. My dad's dad and all of his brothers and generations before, uh, a lot of them died alcoholics. And science and, and, and a lot of folks uh, in the public education system would tell me, you're going to be an alcoholic when you grow up. Now, my dad, uh, uh, I, I, I would assume he drank a little bit when he was in the service. But when he had kids and he got a family, my dad did, my dad quit drinking. I've never saw my dad drink alcohol. Um, he's the, probably the first generation of Carters that didn't uh, uh, struggle with that. But people will say because your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents and your uncles and all those folks were alcoholics, you're going to be an alcoholic. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I mean, that's, that's what they teach. But I don't have to be. Now listen, if I pick up a drink of alcohol and I drink it, I very possibly could be hooked at the very first drink. But I was not born an alcoholic. I may be more susceptible. It may be harder for me to say no, but I've never touched it. I've never tasted it. Thank God he's helped me to be able to say no to that. And I am not an alcoholic, even though some folks in my family past may have been. Hey, listen, people may have talked to you like a dog. You may have been yelled at all your life. You may not know how to treat someone properly, but that doesn't mean you automatically have to be that way. You still have a choice to speak life or death every time you open your mouth. Uh, Proverbs 21, 23. This is number 23. What keeps his soul from troubles? Somebody have 21, 23? So, who keeps his soul from uh, troubles? That's right. He who keeps his mouth and tongue. How many times do you find yourself in a sticky situation simply because of something that you said? If I just didn't say this, I would be in this situation. We, can, we have the ability to keep our, tro our soul from trouble if we learn to keep uh, our mouth and our tongue. Uh, Proverbs 22, 17, second half of the verse. Who wants to read that verse for us? We're going to fill in blanks here. Hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto knowledge. There's two steps here. Hear the wise, but then you have to do something with it. You have to apply your heart to knowledge. And the last one, number 25, Proverbs 25, 11. Somebody want to read that one? So it's asking, what is like apples of gold and pictures of silver? A word fitly spoken, right? What does that mean? That's a kind of funny way to say it. A word fitly spoken. What does that mean? Anybody got a guess? A word carefully chosen. Fitly. It fits just right. Uh, uh, fitly spoken. It's the right words at the right time. It says it's like uh, apples of gold in pictures of silver. Isn't that beautiful? Pictures of golden apples in a picture of silver. Man, that's beautiful. So are the words we choose wisely. How do we ensure that the words we choose are wise. Now, I understand nobody's perfect. We all mess up. I get that. But how can we have better uh, success with picking words wisely and choosing them properly? What do you think? 
Yeah. How about being in tune with the Holy Spirit? Let him guide, well, like the verses before said, set a watch over my uh, 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 mouth and a gate over my tongue. Be in tune with the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we do that? How do we get more in tune with the Holy Spirit? Through prayer and through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, if we haven't cracked our Bible open since Sunday, Thursday, uh, we didn't go to church on Wednesday either. By Thursday or Friday, our word choices are probably not the best. Why is that? Because we've had no relationship with Christ or the Holy Spirit the whole time. We're not in tune with them. He's not revealing anything to us. He's not helping us pick and choose our words wisely. And we're pretty much on our own. Now, I understand God says he'll never leave us and forsake us. I'm not talking about that. God doesn't leave us. But there are times we can be more in tune with the Holy Spirit. We can grieve Him or we can listen and obey Him. And the way we do that is by having a relationship. Reading our Bible, spending time in prayer, having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Does anybody have any questions? We're going to go ahead and end our live portion. Thanks, folks, for joining.